Lovely, welcome to this afternoon's tasting. My name's Liz Whedon and joined this afternoon by Regan McCaffrey. And we are super excited to be tasting these wines with you this afternoon. Uh, this is a, a, an excellent vintage and I think anyone who's followed Bordeaux for a little while probably sick of um, those in Bordeaux and commentators of Bordeaux saying this is an excellent vintage because they all seem to be excellent. Uh, but this one's really exciting. I promise it is. Um, we tasted the wines uh, shortly after they arrived and um, were just so impressed with the quality and can't wait to take you through this collection this afternoon. Uh, just a little bit in terms of how we're going to do the tasting. So I'm going to start with uh, just an overview of the 2018 vintage. Um, so this is actually um, the last vintage that I tasted in situ. Um, of course, since then, have not been able to travel to taste um, these vintages, um, but this is the last one um, that I tasted there. So um, yeah, lo lots of information about the vintage, but I'll talk um, first of all about the 2018 vintage to give you an overview. Uh, what we're then going to do is um, work our way through the wines. Regan and I are going to share that and we'll alternate and talk about the wines as we go through them. Um, now, just from the outset, if you're looking at the collection of the wines, and I'm sure there's a lot of very astute people on the call this afternoon that have probably looked at it and gone, these are all not second growths. And that's right, they're not. Um, these are second growths and friends. Now there's a couple of reasons for that. When we talk of second growths, of course, we're talking about the 1855 classification um, that classified the wines of Bordeaux from first to fifth growth. It hasn't um, been changed bar three modifications since 1855. So some of the wines that are in this afternoon's tasting and you know, particularly something like Ponte Canet, I think you can definitely, um, although it is not a second growth, you can definitely sit it up there with the second growths. And that's what you are looking at this afternoon is a collection of second growths and their friends that sit at the same quality level. Um, the other thing with it is when, of course, we go to the right bank, um, those wines weren't classified. So we have wines from the right bank that we would consider that sit with the second growths. So that's in terms of the collection of wines, how do we end up to have this particular collection of wines um, together? Um, but I think it's more about looking at them and going, these are a collection of wines that, um, yep, there's some second growths in there, but these are second growths and friends. But you should see um, a very, I won't say consistent quality level, because I think you are going to see a huge amount of variation between these wines and a lot of that does have to do with the vintage itself. So um, before we jump into tasting um, the wines and um, whilst I talk about the vintage itself, if you've not poured at least the first wine, I would do that now. Ideally pour the first four wines. We do know that um, because we are sealing these um, very well to transport to you, they do need a little bit of time in the glass um, to get out of that shock of um, the amount of argon gas um, that we threw in there. And actually just seeing Regan um, take a sip of his um, Perrier water um, reminded me to also let you know that you've been sent um, some Perrier for your tasting this afternoon. Um, so we have mountains of Perrier due to arrive in store next month and it's a brilliant water, and I think if you haven't tried it recently, um, need to go back and um, uh, try it again. And actually, uh, with Perrier, a little bit exciting, completely off topic, um, but from December on our website, um, you'll actually be able to go online and make an order that is a standing order. If you've ordered um, perhaps pet food um, during lockdown and made like a standing order for it, you'll be able to make a standing water order on our website. So anyway, something completely off topic that is coming very shortly. Right, so the 2018 vintage in Bordeaux. So let's talk first of all about that. Um, so 2018, if you had to summarize it, I would perhaps look at it as being great to excellent. 
And I think the wines we're looking at this afternoon, I would all put in that excellent category. But overall, um, the vintage is from great to excellent. It doesn't have the consistency that some other vintages have had. And a lot of that is due to the weather conditions and how everyone managed them. Um, this does, of course, as I said before, come on the back of many very good vintages in Bordeaux. Um, but this vintage is very definitely one to explore and one that will benefit uh, from those who put it in the cellar. Um, so it is a vintage where the top wines do really demand some time in the cellar. It's a vintage that's overall characteristics um, and sort of the two words that I found consistently through my tasting notes when I looked at this vintage was that it's all about purity and it has a really seductive nature to it. So while saying, you know, this is a, a vintage that demands some time in the cellar, the seductive nature of it does sort of lure you sort of bring you in and you know you you get to the stage where you're thinking actually do I need to wait so the weather conditions the winter prior to this vintage was unusually wet uh, the rain continued right through spring this brought a huge amount of pressure um, in terms of mildew um, sorry I'll just get whoever's microphone that is there we go. Um, so that brought a huge amount of pressure in terms of mildew. And also there was hail um, as we came into um, the beginning of this vintage. So what that has done is combined to have very, very low yields. And we've got a number of wines through here that have made as low as 25% um, or even lower actually in some instances of what they would normally produce. And some of the lowest yields across the region came in at 11 hectolitres per hectare, which um, is about a quarter of what would normally be there for some of these guys. And a lot of the commonality with those who had the low yields was that they were farming organically or biodynamically. So this is a vintage that if you're practicing those measures, it was very, very hard because the mildew just killed the vineyards. What did follow though was a very warm summer um, and the heat continued month after month creating almost drought-like conditions. So this is really a vintage that um, the growing season has almost everything that nature could throw at it. Um, in fact, it was one of the hottest um, uh, summers in the 20th century for the region. What then um, led to the variability that I talked about before was the vineyard health and whether the vineyard was in such a position where it could retain water. So blue clay, particularly um, in, Puy sorry, in Pomerol, right on the top of that um, plateau, retains water very well. So because you had rain at the beginning, um, you know, somewhere like the vineyards at Shadow Petrus, there was a really good amount of um, water retention in that soil when they came into the drought-like conditions. And in fact, they had a spectacular vintage in 2018. But if um, the vineyard was perhaps in poorer health or not in a location where there was good water retention, um, then the heat will have um, had some detrimental effect on the grapes. Fortunately, with that drought-like condition over the latter part of um, the ripening, um, it did finish with a little bit of rain at the right time that provided the freshness that we want to see in these wines. You know, when you get Merlot and Cabernet that's grown in a drought-like condition, it just can get quite stewed quite quickly and it doesn't provide wines that um, are great for the cellar um, or give you the balance that we're looking for. So the rain when it did come was ideal. Um, it was around harvest. Um, and did provide that freshness. The alcohol levels in 2018 are generally quite high, particularly after 2017, where we saw some quite low um, alcohols. In fact, many of the alcohol levels of the wines we're about to look at are well over 14. And you can read a lot into that statement, well over. Um, this in itself, though, just doesn't appear to be an issue in the wines because they didn't taste hot. 
you know, I look back through my notes of tasting these in barrel and, you know, they were wines that despite the alcohol were showing a huge amount of balance. Um, and, you know, the alcohol really didn't um, factor in them. And I think the reason for that is that there was an abundance of fruit, really sort of silky rich tannins across this vintage, which leads to that seductive nature um, of the year. The acidity and the resulting freshness um, because of that rain at the right amount, right time for the vintage will provide the longevity with the wines. Now with any new vintage of Bordeaux, you do get, you know, questions on what does this relate to? And, you know, I hate going, this vintage is exactly like this because no two, two vintages are the same and they really do um, pick up the characteristics from their unique moment in time. But I do think it is to one sort of some extent useful to give you a little bit of a comparison um, because it puts it in context. And I think when you look at 2018, there is the warmth of the 20, sorry, sorry, of the 2003 vintage. There's the ripeness of the 2009. There's the freshness of the 2010 vintage. Um, but all that said, you know, really the character of the 2018 is that it's got its own character. And um, it does, it is one that has a huge amount of purity to it particularly in Cabernet. And I really like Cabernet from this vintage. Um, it does remind me a lot of the 2016 vintage, um, the Cabernet. Um, white wines from 2018, um, we're actually gonna start with a white wine, um, not an easy task at all. Um, though the, the very best are exceptional, but overall I wouldn't go purchasing broadly through the 2018 vintage for white, unless of course you're purchasing from us, because we've already done the selection for you. We didn't buy that widely from the 2018 vintage for white wine. And that's because overall this vintage, it did require some selection. With Saturn, um, Saturn was a game of two halves. There are really, really good 2018 Saturns, um, but it's those that were patient and waited. So it is an excellent vintage. I think you're about to see that, but the quality is not consistent across the region. Um, it's a year that can't be defined as a Cabernet year or a Merlot year um, or a left bank or a right bank because it is a year where it really did depend what the health was in the vineyard, what the water um, retention was like in the vineyard, what the impact was of the hail in the prior year, um, how um, those in the vineyard and then those in the winery um, treated and made all of the decisions through it. So it is a year with a, a huge amount of variability. Usually there is one um, sort of area that stands out in a vintage and, you know, we all go rushing to purchase Pouillac or purchase Margot. If you had to look for one from this vintage, it is St. Julien. And we're going to see that, I think, in the tasting this afternoon. And probably the, the reason for calling out St. Julien is that it is the one area that is consistent. So you can pretty much say 2018 St. Julien. You could buy across um, that range of wines with confidence. So what we're going to do is um, we are going to move on to tasting the wines and Regan is going to talk to you about the first wine. Um, just before we do that, I'm just going to share my screen there and perhaps Regan, uh, just a thumbs up, we can see that screen okay? Yep, perfect. Okay, so just um, before we do get into the first wine, um, just a, a little bit of an overview on Bordeaux. Um, we've got a great map here. And of course, um, you can see my pointer as well, Regan. Actually, I'll grab a, uh, I will grab a pointer. That will be easier. So guys, you'll be able to change your view. So if you've currently got the full gallery on seeing everybody, if you switch to say, just speaker view, 
um, then you'll be able to see the map bigger and you can also make those bigger or smaller depending on what you're looking at there because we're going to have quite a few pictures of the chateaus and that as we go through as well cool so the map you're looking at here is um uh of course um bordeaux um so just in the center here and reagan you can pick my um, mouse up there now yeah yes yep okay, that. perfect so this is the center of bordeaux so this is a city here and when we talk of bordeaux we talk about the left bank and the right bank so when we talk about the left bank, it's the river, the Gironde running through here. It's the left bank of this that we're talking about. And this is the Medoc running up through here. And this is the area and um, running down um, also into PSAC because there was one uh, property from down there as well of significance in the 1855 classification but it's the Medoc here that was classified in 1855. And then when we come over to this side of the river, this is the right bank um, area, and we're very interested today in Pomerol and saint Emilion. Um, generically talking, this is Merlot country, and this side is Cabernet country. And when you're looking at why that would be the case is you've got along the side of the river here, really deep gravel beds. And this is where Cabernet likes growing. Over here, you've got a high level of clay. You've also got gravel, but you've got a high level of clay and that's what Merlot likes. The other great variety that sort of is a second fiddle over here in Pomerol saint Emilion, particularly relevant to saint Emilion, is Cabernet Franc. Then of course down here is where you've got Saturn. So this is where you get the sweet wines from and PSAC that we're gonna, and the Grav region where we're gonna look at this afternoon as well, which actually now the city of Bordeaux has grown such that it actually engulfs um, this appellation. To give you an idea sort of of distances, apart from the fact that going anywhere in Bordeaux is a nightmare because the city is growing so quickly. Um, in fact, not dissimilar to Auckland um, when we're not in lockdown, um, is the city is growing so quickly that the infrastructure is not keeping up. And almost every um, road in the city is closed at one end or the other for roadworks. So that's why it looks a lot like Auckland in the centre. Um, but if you were to drive from here um, over to Lebon um, and you didn't sort of get stuck in um, a huge amount of traffic and if you do you will just sit there for hours um, but that's about an hour 20 that distance and if you're going to go from here right to the top of the Medoc um, again sort of depends on the traffic but you know you're about an hour and a half two hours sort of up there so we're, we're talking quite a distance here um, with the region that is Bordeaux. So a little bit of an overview for you there we'll move to the first wine shall we Regan? All right, so the first wine we're going to be trying is Blanc de Lynchbarge. And Lynchbarge obviously is a very, very famous estate, um, a fifth growth, but a fifth growth in name only. It was really the first of these estates from the lower classifications that really uh, made a step forward uh, in, in huge quality. And Lynchbarge has been known probably for the last 20 odd years as really a wine of, of second growth quality. Uh, but what we're trying here is the, uh, the Blanc de Lynchbarge, and this is a blend of Kind of the three traditional white varieties um, in the region. Now you'll notice that this is not a Pouillac, uh, it's only an AOC Bordeaux and that's because under the appellation rules for Pouillac um, they're not allowed to make white wine. Um, so the grapes are grown from within Pouillac, uh, I think it's from um, six different parcels that they've got, no sorry eight different parcels from about six hectares out of their total kind of hundred hectares that they've got and what's making this up is you're getting these Kind of fresh exotic fruits from the, the Sauvignon Blanc and then you're getting um, dried flowers, candied flowers from the, the Semillon um, which is very very traditional in Bordeaux uh, but what we've also got in this is some of the delicate kind of woody notes and vanilla notes from some Muscadel in there as well. So you've got freshness and strength around this kind of round um, ample elegant structure as well um, all been in barrel too. So before we kind of talk a bit more about Lynchbarge and the wine, let's give it a taste.
Mm. Um, this is one of my favorite white Bordeaux. And you, as you can see with that Muscadel in there, it's in a style that's a little bit different from the classic. It's not super steely edged um, and it's not too Semillon dominated either. So you can see um, in the picture there, uh, Chateau Lynch Barge itself. Now, obviously uh, an estate that has a very, very long history in Bordeaux. Its name comes from the section uh, within Pauillac where the Chateau is located um, called the Barge, B-A-G-E-S. And the vineyard was originally kind of established and expanded uh, by the Dijon family and they sold it on in, I think, 1728. So it's had a long history in the region. Uh, and in 1749, uh, the Drulon family who brought it, he bequeathed the estate to his daughter, Elizabeth. And she was the wife of a man called Thomas Lynch. And that's where the, the name originally um, was inspired by. But it actually wasn't sold under that name for um, a long time, including during the 1855 classification. Uh, it was selling under the name of Chateau Jurin Barge. And that's because at the time the Chateau was owned by a Swiss wine merchant by the name of Sebastian Jurin. And in um, 1862, about 10 years after the, the classification, it was sold to uh, the Carew brothers and they um, restored the estate's name at that time and they called it Chateau Lynch Barge, combining the two names, the original name and the, the Lynch family name in honor of them. Um, now, they sold it on, I think in uh, 1870, and they sold it to the Kazars family and the Kazars family still own it to this day. Um, so kind of in the 1930s, uh, Jean Charles Kazars, he was already in charge of uh, La Homme de Pez at the time in saint Estef, And he agreed to lease the vines of Lynch Barge um, at the time because he couldn't afford to buy the estate. Um, it was, but it was also really dilapidated at the time. It was in need of this really extensive replanting. And that was too expensive for the owner. So for cars, he had the time and the ability to manage it and fix it up, but lacked the funds to actually buy it. And I think so the, the family has been leasing it for a long time, uh, but the Kazaz family only actually purchased it, sorry, um, on the eve of the Second World War. And they've run it um, ever since. Um, they own uh, Villa Bellia um, in the Grave as well. Now, as I said, they've got um, about uh, 100 hectares of, of vines. Um, this particular wine, Blanc de Lynchbarge, um, they only first started making this uh, in 1990, was the first vintage for this wine. Gee, Liz, do you want to click through that, um, that picture? It seems to be stuck, I think, on the, uh, on the estate picture. There you go, there's a, there's a good shot inside the barrel hall there. Uh, so yeah, 1990 was the first vintage um, uh, for this wine. And they've been doing a lot of work at Lynchbarge over the years. There's obviously, as the fame of the estate has increased, um, the amount of money they've been making has increased and there's a huge um, amount of investment being in the vineyard um, and in the chai and the barrel hall over the last kind of 20 years or so. Um, so the vineyard itself, the main vineyard is planted to about 75% Cabernet, 17% Merlot, 6% Franc and 2% Petit Verdot. And you're on this tour of kind of gravel, chalk and sand soils. Obviously here in Pauillac, we're not far from the estuary itself really, really free draining. And you've got two main sections to the vineyard. You've got um, the biggest portion of the vines are planted close to the chateau, which is on the, the barge, the tr traditional barge plateau. And we're reaching a peak height here of 20 meters above sea level. So that's 20, 30 meters is reasonably high uh, in this part of the Madoc here. And they, they, there's not a lot of variation to the land as well. Uh, then they've also got some vines that are down in the kind of the far southwest of the Appalachian next to Pichon Lalande, which is kind of on the St. Julian border. Those are also used in the Grand Vin. So you've got kind of like four main blocks for the vineyard and that gets subdivided up into 140 parcels. Um, so of that 100 hectares, six hectares reserved for um, Blanc de Lynchbarge and about eight of those 140 parcels. So these are all to the west of the estate. And the plantings that they've got is 53% uh, Sauvignon Blanc, 32% uh, Semillon, and 15% Muscadel. Now, um, some of the vines obviously date back to, to pre-1990, um, but they actually try and keep the vines for this reasonably young. Um, the average age is only about 20 years old. Um, so the oldest ones, I think, are getting up into the mid-30s at the moment, uh, but there is some young vines that go into this as well. Um, so the way that they, they generally make this is a, a combination of 50% uh, new barrels, 
um, 20% uh, one-year-old barrels, and then the other 30% is still vinified in vats. And they age it um, on its leaves for at least six months and daily lees stirring as it goes through there. So they're really trying to, to get a lot of texture into the wine by doing that. It's the way that you would make a, a really kind of high quality Chardonnay as well. Um, there's been a lot of extra precision in the way that they've made this wine since um, 2006 with all the investment that they've done in the estate. Um, everything now is done in the absence of, uh, of oxygen and under argon as well, really trying to prevent oxidation to the fruit and um, contribute to the aging potential of, of the wine. Now, I think this year in 2018, there was actually a little bit more Sauvignon Blanc than normal. So this one is 59% Sauvignon and then almost equal Sauvignon and Muscadel, 21% Sem, 20% Muscadel. But their um, conditions this year, they said um, really, really good. Um, obviously they had those particularly rainy winter conditions, um, but that was needed to kind of recharge the, the groundwater. Um, great harvest, um, really favorable conditions. They always start with the Muscadel, um, then followed by the Sauvignon Blanc, and the Sauvignon is always the last to, to come in. Um, um, harvesting, they always do it in the morning um, so that they, it's not sitting out there during those high afternoon temperatures. And they said the state of the grapes, the white grapes that came in this year was absolutely perfect. Um, so since 2013, when they bring the grapes in, it depends on the varietal and the kind of the berry quality, um, but everything here is direct pressed. There's no de-stemming. Um, and sometimes they do a little bit of that though, if the, the quality of the stems isn't quite good enough, but they didn't have that problem this year. Um, cold maceration for 12 hours using dry ice to keep it really cold. Um, obviously that, that barrel um, aging is a mix of those new barrels and those older barrels as well um, for about six months. And this is a wine that has really good aging capacity as well. I brought quite a few bottles of the 2011 of this wine uh, and we opened up one just the other day. Um, and I would say that's about perfect drinking now. I've got one left now. And I think, so this is a wine probably drink up to around about maybe 12 years of age. Don't think you need to leave it much longer than that. Um, but especially when you've got a vintage that's quite warm, like this vintage is, you can see the acidity is a little bit lower. Um, so it's actually really quite approachable um, now, I have to say. Um, compared to some of the white Bordeaux that are really high in semillon and high in acidity, um, especially from the Pessac and the Graves area, that need a lot more time because they're just quite steely and quite hard edged where they're young. Um, that's not this wine. Re super enjoyable right now, actually. Yeah, as it's opening up in the glass, it's, it's, it's really, really nice. Yeah, definitely. As Reagan, I think it's, you know, it, had some comments here down the side, but you know, I, I think it's just delicious. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Stephen agree a hundred percent with your, you know, that mouth watering acidity, but I think that acidity leaves you wanting to go back and, and to taste it again, which yeah. is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, rather than a kind of a, oh, that's too acidic. I need to leave it another five years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think with, um, with white Bordeaux, there's for me, there's kind of two windows. It's a, a little bit like Saturn as well. There's two windows for in, which are brilliant for it when it's young, when it's old. Um, and, you know, that's what I think is one of the joys with white Bordeaux is even the very, very top ones, um, you know, you can enjoy them young. Um, they're a, a really nice, fruity expression. Um, but then when they age, there's something completely different. You know, they're, they're really oily, really rich, really complex and very, very different to what you see when they're young. Um, but yeah, it's quite nice that it does have those two very diverse characteristics to it, White Bordeaux. I, oh. like, I like what Jacob um, said there as well about how the, the Sem and the Muscadel really change the character of Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, basically 60% of that bottle is Sauvignon Blanc and... Um, there's, there's not a lot of classic sav notes coming through. I, I wish we did a little bit more of this here um, in New Zealand with these types of blends. Mm. Yeah, plant some more, more Semillon and more Muscadel, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> give, give it a twist to New Zealand Sauvignon. Mm. Very good. Cool. So should we get into the red wine? Is everyone ready? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, we'll go back to... Um, just show you um, some pictures again. 
Sorry, we'll get the technology sorted here. Right. So you'll remember before um, when I was showing you the map of Bordeaux, we were talking about left bank, right bank. Where we're going for the first of our red wines um, is we are going to the right bank um, and we are heading to Le Fleur Petrus. So we are heading very firmly to Pomerol. So just in terms of um, the map that you've got there, you can see Pom you can see Lebon here and the river coming through. Um, and then this is Pomerol sitting here and Le Long de Pomerol beside it and then saint Emilion. Um, and then you've got the other sort of um, satellite saint Emilion appellations out to the side here. Um, and although not, I don't think, 100% to scale this map, um, but let's, let's go with it. It's pretty close. Um, what it does highlight, I think, for you is just how small Pomerol is. And in comparison to what we see on the left bank, when we're talking about the properties over here, we really are talking about very, very tiny properties relatively. So in terms of La Fleur Petrus, and um, you know, there's two names there that probably will jump out and be very familiar to everyone. Uh, and that is the name Petrus, but also the name La Fleur. Uh, because, of course, there are two very famous properties in Pomerol, Chateau Petrus and Chateau Le Fleur. Uh, so how is it that we have a chateau called Chateau Le Fleur Petrus? Well, it is um, the combination of the name of its two neighbours, being that Chateau Le Fleur Petrus sits between Le Fleur and Petrus, or beside Le Fleur and Petrus. Um, it's a very historic property in the Pomerol area and uh, dates, the chateau itself dates back to 1782. Uh, in the early 19th century, the Constant family owned Le Fleur Petrus, and you can see um, the current home of Le Fleur Petrus there. But when the Constant family had it, they also owned Chateau Clenet, which is another very, very good uh, property in Pomerol. Over the years, um, it's had many um, different owners. And in fact, in the early years, if you bought a bottle of what we now know as Le Fleur Petrus, it would have been labeled Petrus Le Fleur. So it was labeled originally the other way around, which is a tad confusing. But really the modern um, era of Le Fleur Petrus comes from 1953 onwards. And it's at that point that um, Jean-Pierre Moex purchased the property. So we know them very well as the negotiant um, firm based in Lebon um, that Glengarry has worked with um, since we first imported the 1982 vintage from them. What they did when they purchased um, Le Fleur Petrus is they immediately increased its size. And this is actually a really good map um, just to show you where they increased the size from. So if we find um, number nine there, which that one there, um, hopefully you can see my pointer, is Le Fleur Petrus. Number eight there across the road is Petrus. Number seven there is Le Fleur. And of course um, it's Petrus and um, Le Fleur that it took its name from. But if we go back to Le Fleur Petrus itself, it actually wraps itself around the back here. And this property over here, number six, Le Gay, is where the Moex family took four hectares from Le Gay when they purchased Le Fleur Petrus and added four hectares from that to Le Fleur Petrus. Okay, so different laws in Bordeaux in comparison to say Burgundy where you know adding things together doesn't happen um, in fact dividing things up happens is you can actually uh, increase and decrease sizes of properties in Bordeaux um, but we will be here all night if we start on the pros and cons of a piece of soil 
versus ownership and uh, the human touch to it, which really is the two defining characters between the two regions. But anyway, so 1953, the Moex family purchased it. Unfortunately, um, in 1956, there was a devastating frost across Pomerol and they lost all of their vineyards. So all of what was Lafleur Petrus was decimated in 1956 and had to be replanted, um, which they did. Um, the next sort of generation that um, took over was Christian Moex. And Christian Moex took over in 78. And what he did at that time, and there's another great map, is he added another four hectares. And he took the oldest vines from Chateau Legay and put them into Le Fleur Petrus. And you can see here that we have Le Fleur Petrus 1, Le Fleur Petrus 2, Le Fleur Petrus 3, because we're, we're going to add some more a little bit later as well. But Chris Charm, when he took over in 78, added another four hectares. The management of it today is with Edouard Moex, so his son. And it's now 18.7 um, uh, hectares, which in terms of Pomerol is a, of a reasonable size. In terms of how they manage the vineyard, um, talking to Edward about it, and inter interesting, I think that, you know, when you go and visit with him, the first thing you do is you stand in a vineyard. And, you know, a lot of properties in Bordeaux, a lot of the big properties, you know, you'd be welcomed into um, the welcoming room in one of the chateaus and, you know, probably plied with a glass of champagne before you did anything else, but not, not here and not with the Moex family. You go and stand in a vineyard. And I said to Edward, I said, you know, are, are you looking to go towards organics? Are you going to convert? And he sort of, you know, didn't want to have the conversation. And eventually we had the conversation. And I said to him, you know, what's your view? And he said, oh, he said, it's just all certification and a piece of paper and all just too much trouble. And I said, OK, but, you know, how are you actually managing the property? And he said, well, it's like this. He said, it's, it's about a reason to struggle. Um, and he said, we don't add anything to the vineyard unless it needs it, and we try not to add anything. So that's very much the approach that they're taking there. Now, before I go on, I've got a lot to tell you about the Fleur Petrus. Um, I see, um, Glenn, you've already told us it's a knockout. It is. I had a little taste before, but please do go ahead and let's have a taste of it um, before we go on with a bit more information. Mm. Yeah, but, uh, this vintage is just uh, so good. Mm. Incredible concentration to that, isn't it? But I think you can see one of the characteristics of the 18. Concentration and intensely concentrated fruit, but then a freshness at the end that you perhaps wouldn't expect with that level of concentration. Um, in terms of what this is made up of, um, it's 90% Merlot and 6% Cabernet Franc and 3% Petit Verdot. Now, that is almost exactly um, what, sorry, it's actually 7% Cabernet Franc. It's almost exactly um, what the vineyard is actually planted in. Um, recently, the vineyard has changed in terms of the total makeup. And that is because they've added another four hectares. They did it in 2012. Um, and it's actually um, that little bit um, down towards La Panne and Trottenoir that you see there is they've headed down towards that area and purchased another little bit there. And in that, um, they've actually got some more Merlot so Cabernet Franc actually used to be around um, sort of 20% of what they had, but with the new purchase, it's now Merlot is a higher percentage in it. So with these three different parts, um, the most northerly of them is predominantly gravel. Um, the most southerly, southerly sorry, is clay, 
And in the middle, um, so that one there that you've got sort of referenced as Le Fleur Petrus 2, is actually slightly warmer than the other two. So you've got um, three very, very different um, parcels here. I think when you look at the wine itself, um, you know, it often gets referenced to Petrus and referenced to Le Fleur because of its name and because of where it sits. But the characteristic of Le Fleur Petrus is nothing like those two wines. It's very individual and it's very specific to Le Fleur Petrus. And I think what always gets me with this is, yeah, it's impressive in concentration, but it's got this purity and finesse and elegance to it. It's quite a charming wine. You know, you sort of, when you first taste it, it knocks you around and tells you, to, tells you that it's there. But then when you look at it a bit more closely, it's the elegance and the finesse to this that I think um, is really impressive. Now, a little bit more about it. Um, 2004 onwards, they did change a bit in terms of their um, vinification um, and moved to stainless steel. Um, so um, for fermentation and for malolactic fermentation. And actually from 2009 onwards, um, they have a manual sorting of grapes and also optical sorting. Um, so with the Moex family, there's just no expense spared in making the best quality wine they can. In terms of quality, when you look at Le Fleur Petrus historically, 2009, it took a massive jump in quality. And since then, the quality has just been incredible. And I think, you know, the inclusion of it in this tasting, it sits there really well alongside the other wines. The vintages um, from 2009 that have just been incredible, uh, 2009, 2010, 15, 16, 18, 19, and 20. So they're on a roll. Um, these guys are, are heading forward at a rate of knots. Um, for those interested, 18 months in French oak, 50% of which was new. Um, and in terms of production, um, it's 7,000 cases here. So not a, not a massive amount. What do you reckon, Regan? Yeah, fabulous wine. And I love the, the tannic structure to it as well, which you, you always get in Pomerol. It's, this is going to be a really nice comparison, actually, between this and the Belay Menage, because they're almost exactly the same sapage this year. They're, they're both 90% Merlot, um, but we're going to see a very, very different structure to them because of the soil that they're grown on. Um, but I always love when people try Pomerol who haven't drunk a lot of Merlot outside of the New World, and they're surprised by the tannins there. That can be every bit as strong as you get out of Cabernets in the left bank. And that's, that's what Pomerol is known for. I mean, solid dense Merlot with incredible aging capacity. And that's what we're seeing here. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing wine. And I, I agree that quality is really ramped up in, in recent years as well. Um, so is the price, I have to say. <laughs> well, you know, we're going to pay for optical sorters. They're, they're millions yeah. of dollars. They've got two, I think, now. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed that wine. Shall we move on to the next one, Regan? Yeah. So where we're going next is um, Saint Emilion. And so in Pomerol there, there has, is not and has never been a classification of the wines. Uh, but in Saint Emilion, there is a classification of the wines. And under that classification, uh, Belay Menage is a second growth. It's um, known as a Premier Grand Cru Class B. Um, Premier Grand Cru Class A has four estates in it. Uh, it used to be just two. It used to be just Chateau Ozone and Chateau Cheval Blanc alone at the top of the pyramid. Um, but the thing with the classification of Saint Emilion, uh, it was first done only in 1955 and it gets redone every 10 years. Uh, and in the last uh, redoing of this classification uh, in 2012, uh, both Chateau Angelus and Chateau Pave were upgraded from class B to class A. Uh, now, that was very controversial. Um, there's many lawsuits about that at the moment, including the fact that the owner of one of those two estates uh, is also on the judging board who decides who gets upgraded. Um, so classic French situation there. And it gets even more complicated in that the next classification is about to happen. 
and the two greatest estates in Saint Emilion, which is Ozone and Cheval Blanc, have decided that they will be withdrawing from the classification and will be no longer included in it because they disagree with the whole process. So that's a little bit of a background to, uh, to that. Uh, but Belair Menage sits um, uh, firmly in Premier Grand Cru Class B, um, that classification since 1955. Um, but this is actually one of the greatest estates in Saint Emilion, and I'll, I'll kind of explain why that is. And it has been um, for actually many thousands of years. This is an estate um, that originally um, was, um, uh, was farmed by the Romans, cultivated by the ancient Romans. Um, a lot around this area, of course, the, the poet Orzonius, that's where the name um, Orzone um, came from, which is very, very close to Belair Menage. And it's believed that he, his property that he owned was actually there um, at the time on the spot. Now, um, Belair Menage itself, um, if we skip forward about kind of, you know, almost 2000 years from there, uh, the viticultural journey began about in 1691. And in 1691 is when we kind of see the first records of Belair Menage. Uh, but it was already renowned for its wines and very, very sought after in the area and abroad um, already then in the kind of the, uh, the late 17th century. Now, it was owned for over 200 years by a family called the Canole de Lescore family. Uh, and the vineyard really kind of blossomed in earnest in the 18th century uh, when you had the second generation kind of at the helm. Um, now, the, uh, if we look forward to kind of the French Revolution, on the eve of that, the wines of Chateau Belair, as it was known at the time, were sold at uh, two or three times the price of all of the other Grand Vins from Saint Emilion. Um, so this was regarded as the greatest wine of Saint Emilion uh, at that time. Uh, and even as early as 1802, I think, uh, part of the wine produced here was actually bottled at the Chateau. And that was an extremely rare practice. Uh, now, as we went through the 19th century, the distribution of Bordeaux kind of started to formalize and you had these official and unofficial classifications start to take place. Uh, and in 1850, uh, there was the very first edition of the, the Coq and Ferret Guide. Uh, Belier was, was crowned the top of all of the premier crews in, in saint Emilion. Uh, and then another important kind of chapter for the property concluded at the end of the 19th century where you had the stone quarries uh, were permanently closed. And these are quarries uh, mining the limestone under the village of Saint Emilion. They've been mined commercially since at least the 15th century. And there's a vast labyrinth spanning kind of five stories and 86 kilometers of, of galleries uh, of these quarries that are directly underneath the vineyard of, um, of the Le Menage. Now, it was brought by the Chillon family in, um, in 1916. Uh, and when they brought it, um, uh, they, uh, I think, were the first official winery in Saint Emilion to bottle their own wine. Um, and when they, they bottled it, um, they also owned Orzone at the time, which was right next door. And unfortunately, due to the attack of Biloxera and continuous uh, kind of neglect, they put all of their efforts into Chateau Orzone uh, and completely uh, neglected Chateau Bellier. So it really fell into this kind of dilapidated condition. Uh, and what was happening at this time was all of the best fruit that was coming from the vineyards of Bilia was all going into the wine at Orzone. Um, so during this period from kind of 1916, almost through to really oh, the 1980s or the 1990s, um, Bellia previously had been known as the greatest estate in saint Emilion, and it just disappeared off the map people forgot about it. And um, the wines of Orzone were seen as much, much better because that was where the family was putting all of their effort. They were stealing all the best fruit from, uh, from Belia and taking it over there. Um, now, what happened is of course, we had uh, uh, another visionary um, of, the, of the right back, which was Jean-Pierre Moex, um, who the Moex family now own this estate today. And he was predicting this unsung potential of the right bank as early as the 1930s. And of course, Jean-Pierre Moex devoted his whole career to kind of promoting and distributing the wines of Pomerol and, and saint Emilion. Uh, now, he had long been kind of fascinated by this historical vineyard of, of Bellia. Uh, and he'd gone through and he'd looked at a lot of the old texts um, and the old vineyard maps and stuff. And he was convinced that the vineyard of Bellia uh, was the greatest tour uh, 
um, in all of Saint Emilion. Uh, and he had this, uh, he got the distribution of the wine, I think from the second half of the 20th century. And he had this dream of being able to actually acquire the property and restore it to the quality that it was always known as. Uh, and I know that, that um, he told his son, Christian Moex, that he believed it was the only property on the right bank of Bordeaux that had the Tuar that could rival Petrus itself. Uh, and of course, they own Petrus as well. So, um, so he would know this. Uh, and of course, in 2008, um, Jean-Pierre Moex's son, Christian, and his grandson, Edouard, uh, finally achieved um, their grandfather and their father's dream um, of buying the estate. Um, so they bought it in, in 2008, uh, bought the, the final shares of it, uh, and immediately renamed it. Uh, they renamed it to Belair Menage. And they, they called the name Menage. It was chosen by Christian Moex. And it was in the memory um, of uh, Jean-Pierre Moex's uh, mother, Anne Adele Monage, uh, Christian's grandmother, uh, and obviously Edward's great-grandmother. She was the first woman from the Moex family to settle um, in the village of Saint-Emilion in 1931. So the 2008 vintage was the first vintage where the Moex family was completely in charge of all of the vineyards, the winemaking, the marketing, uh, and the debut of this new beautiful label as well. Um, and you can see there a shot of, uh, of some of the vineyards coming down the sides there. That's off the, um, uh, off the top of the plateau and down on the, the hillside sides. Now, they, they managed to increase the size of their vineyards here following that 2012 classification. Um, also, that 2008, um, the first vintage under the Belair Menage label was really the, the greatest wine produced at the property in decades as well. Um, so in 2012, uh, they also purchased Chateau Magdalene and they officially merged it into Belair Menage, creating this even larger estate. And then they embarked on this kind of extensive work uh, in all of those underground limestone caves and quarries that are underneath the vineyard. So they installed all these new pillars and belts to provide support for the limestone caves, and they finished that construction in 2016. So all, a lot of the wine is stored in these underground quarries, a little bit like we, we see in, in Champagne. Um, now, um, all the kinds of changes that they made here, um, much more stringent selection in the vineyards, uh, reducing the yields and picking much, much later than was doing. So this allowed for harvesting much, much riper fruit. Um, 2009, they also began using again an optical sorting machine. Uh, and again, from 2009, um, only the second vintage, uh, we saw that pay off again. So the wines of Belair Menage are much like fleshier and richer and way more concentrated than they ever were under uh, Belair. And they're replanting the vineyards as well. That's going to take place over the next kind of 20 years or so. Um, now, the vineyard itself, it's, it's 23.5 hectares, uh, and it's right on the outskirts of the village of saint Emilion, And it's 90% Merlot, 10% uh, Cabernet Franc. Um, so that's pretty much what we find in the wine here as well. There was some old vines of kind of Malbec and Petit Verdot that were there when the Moex family took over and they've pulled all of those out. Now you've got a few different um, toir here at this part of saint Emilion. So you've got um, limestone on the plateau and the top terrace, and you've got clay and limestone um, on the slopes. Uh, and the best toir is kind of right on the peak of the plateau, just to the right of this picture here. And that's about 88 meters in elevation. And they've got some very, very old vines is one of the advantages that Belair Menage has. So the average age is 40 years uh, and they've got um, some, uh, quite a lot of vines that are at 70 years of age, planted in the early 1950s uh, through the 1930s. And they've also got the oldest vines in all of the right bank. Um, they've got some vines that were planted in 1900. Uh, and I don't think there's anything older in the right bank at all. Very, very high density plantings here as well. Uh, 6,600 vines per hectare, and some of the new plantings of the Cabernet Franc are at 7,400 vines per hectare. Um, so both of those are about double um, the planting density that we would see in the Hawke's Bay, for example. Now they've got um, two different uh, laser sorting tables. There's Edouard Moex, that's a great uh, um, shot of him there holding the bottle. They've got um, two different laser sorting tables and been in use since 2009, also optical sorting. Um, they use thermoregulated concrete uh, vats and thermoregulated stainless steel um, in the cellar. 
Um, all the malo is done in the vat here. Um, you're aging it an average of 50% new um, oak for 18 months. Um, so it's a reasonably long time. Now I think in um, this particular vintage here, I'll see if I can find this, this spec on this here. Yeah, this had, this had 16, between 16 and 18 months in oak, 50% um, new. Um, now, interestingly enough, uh, the blend here in this particular vintage is significantly more Merlot um, than they have planted in the vineyard. I actually got that wrong before. So the vineyard is 90% Merlot, 10% Cab Franc. Uh, the 2018 is 98% Merlot. There is only 2% Cabernet Franc in this blend here. Uh, now that's interesting because that's the only place I've found that info is directly on Belia Menage's website. Um, most of the tasting notes that you see out there use the 90-10 kind of mark. So this is almost 100% Merlot. Um, and what we're seeing here is a very different expression of Merlot than what we saw um, uh, from Pomerol. And a lot of that is coming from that limestone in the soil here. Yeah, I think what we're also seeing with that, you know, the Merlot from this vintage is where it was grown in conditions where water was retained. It's got this wonderful concentration from mm. the drought conditions, but then it's got this freshness to it. And I think when I look at these two, two wines side by side, there's one other sort of overarching characteristic of the 2018 vintage, which is really clearly showing in these two wines is that the distinction between the different appellations is very high. So sometimes you get vintages in Bordeaux where the vintage characteristics or um, the techniques being used, you get a sort of more of a homogenized approach to things. But with the 2018 vintage, you get a really high level of typicity of where they're from. Um, and you can see that with this. I mean, there's two wines that are just so close together in terms of where they're growing and relatively close in terms of the, the grape varieties. Um, and they're like chalk and cheese. Mm. Uh, and, you know, that, that's what this vintage um, is about very, very the, much. So. The interesting thing as well is, is that you don't normally see that clear difference in typicity in a warmer vintage like this is as well. Usually that's in the cooler ones. So that, that definitely makes 18 quite unusual. Um, they said on their, on their technical notes when they were doing the, um, the picking here, there was an attack of mildew during spring, uh, but they put um, a massive effort into the vineyard here. And that's one of the reasons why the cost of this just keeps going up. Um, if we look at during the summer, they had a team of 60 working the vineyard doing the crop thinning. Um, trying to get that desired yield down to the, um, to the right amount for the parcel uh, and the age of the vines. And that's how they get this perfect balance there. It was um, 16,800 man hours of meticulous work in the vineyard um, just for this vintage. And I, I think this is a wine that if you've been following it for a few years since it changed to Belém Menage, um, certainly the Moex family think that this wine um, has the, the capacity in the future to be uh, certainly one of the greatest wines of the right bank right up there by, with Petrus. Now, the interesting thing though, is that when you look at the price of it, it's priced nowhere near Petrus. Uh, it keeps going up each year, um, but they've always said that this is a wine that they want to let the market um, decide and accept the quality and the pricing of the wine. They started off the pricing of this, I think at about 300 bucks a bottle. Uh, in the 200, uh, 2008 vintage, it might have even been a little bit less. Uh, and it's going up um, purely due to market demand. They said, we're not going to set the price of this um, at the level where we think it, it is. We're going to let the market push that price up over time. So it's a very different way of doing it rather than sometimes we see in the new world where the, a new wine comes out and it's immediately the most expensive wine in New Zealand at 300 bucks a bottle or 200 bucks or something like that for the region. Um, even though it's got no track record. Um, they fully expect this wine to be thousands of dollars a bottle uh, in the future, but they're going to let it they get there um, organically. They're not going to push it there immediately, which is nice to see. I think it also shows the level of confidence they've got. 
Absolutely. here for sure. Yeah. Yeah, Glenn, you're right. Their, their second wine is very good value for money as well. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's the other thing worth noting with this vintage. And, um, you know, although it's not homogenous, where there is quality, quality exists at all price points. And I think, you know, we've started to have some Petit Chateau arrive from the um, 2018 vintage and we've selected very carefully what we've brought in, but where there is quality, it can be, you know, at $16 and at $16,000, you know, the homogenous, the lack of um, consistency is just in terms of where it's come from in the region, but, you know, there, there can be quality definitely across price points. Right, should we move to the next one? Yeah. I see your question there as well, Stephen, about the alcohol. It's very, very difficult actually to find the alcohol levels of these two wines because I've been looking for a little bit uh, and not, not, none of the wine writers seem to mention it, which is interesting, but I can guarantee you both of these are over 14. Yeah, I'm thinking we're late 14s on them. Yeah. Um, I mean, the balance of the Belay Menage is incredible and incredibly fine tannins as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can have a look on the bottle, but I don't know that it's going to necessarily help us. <laughs> but we can have a look. <laughs> cool. Okay, so we'll go on to the next wine. Um, so we are moving. Sorry, I'll just get the uh, slides up for you. Two things at once here for me, some technology. Also, Stephen, you were absolutely right about that Cabernet Franc being more um, influential in the, uh, um, sorry, um, it's not so influential in the Belay because it's not there, but um, it does taste like it. I agree. Mm. It's usually quite a lot more than that 2%. Mm. Right, so we're changing uh, gear dramatically here and heading back to the left bank and heading to uh, PSAC. So PSAC, you might remember in that map that we had right at the beginning is um, the Appalachian sort of right down the bottom on the left, not as far um, down as Saturn, but the one that is pretty much now engulfed by the city of Bordeaux. Uh, so Smitho Lafitte, it is a property with an impressive 800 year history. And uh, in fact, if we go back to 1365, when de Bosque planted on the plateau and called it Lafitte. And that's where the first part of the name being now the last part, Lafitte came from. And it was known for, for quite a long time as simply Lafitte. But then the Smith part of it came about from George Smith, who was the owner in 1720. And he decided he was going to add his name to it. And we then get Smith Holafit. Uh, the property itself, although it's very old, it's, it's recent history from 1990 onwards that really tells the current story. And it changed owners at that stage. And they did a huge amount of things to change the fortune of this property. And since the 2000 vintage, the quality um, at Smith Ola Feet has never been at such levels. So some of the things that they did to change the fortune of this property, it's a gorgeous property, um, is in, 2000, sorry, in 1995, they built their own cooperage. So within those buildings there, we have a cooperage that produces 70% of the barrels that they use. So they produce 70% of their own barrels. In 2009, they did something quite fascinating. They have started to use satellite imagery to find the perfect moment for picking each of the different plots within the vineyard. So there's 140 different parcels that they've identified through this imagery in the vineyard that all ripen at different times. So we're talking down to quite minute parcels within the property, um, 
that, you know, it's a 78 hectare property, so it's a reasonable size. Um, but I'll just jump back one there. Um, but they've divided it up into all of these little bits using some satellite imagery to give them more precision into picking each particular part at the right time. There's a commonality that we're hearing a lot with these wines. These guys also have purchased an optical sorting machine. There's a few of them in Bordeaux now, so we are getting optical sorting here. Um, and what they have done is started to move the property towards biodynamics. So it is now organic um, and self-sustainable, but they're heading towards organics um, as well. The average vine age that you're looking at in that um, vineyard there um, is 65 years old. So they have really nice old vine age as well. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, as I said, 65 year old vine age there. The other thing they've done is they've added a couple of winemaking um, consultants. So they've got Michelle Rowland um, helping them here, which um, will dramatically change the, the characteristic of the wine. In terms of this 2018, let's um, just give this a taste and then talk about the makeup of this one. Because there's something quite particular in this wine, which I actually wonder from tasting it before I tell you what it is. Um, Mm. Well, it's impressive. Just tasting that, it's very distinctly grave. You know, it's got that sort of earthy, savory characteristic that you get from the wines down there. And that sort of almost leathery nature to the tannins, which is also very characteristic of that area. It's a very, very um, specific style. And like I said, with the previous two wines, you're seeing really clearly what the appellation looks like. In terms of the blend for this one, 60% Cabernet, 34% Merlot, 4% Cabernet Franc, 2% Petit Verdot. 60% of this has been aged in new barrels for 17 months. Now, a couple of things that are very different with the 2018 vintage for this property. 50%, sorry, only 50% of what they normally would produce was made. So their yields were only 21 hectolitres per hectare, which is very, very tiny. So the reason for that is they got very badly affected by mildew. And because of um, the organic practices, um, they the organic treatment that they'd used didn't protect them from the mildew and the intensity of that through this vintage. The thing that I mentioned that is quite different in this wine, which I think you can see um, in the structure of the palate and also the nature of the tannins, is that with the Merlot, 20% of the Merlot um, that's gone into this wine has been um, whole bunches. So there's whole bunch fermentation in this which I think is giving a really, so you're getting a bit of a, the tannins um, from those stalks as well. And you're getting a sort of more juicy in a way, but more sort of open character to the mid palate, I think, um, from that. But, you know, this is a, a property with 800 years of history that is not sitting on its laurels. And I think, you know, that's the thing with Bordeaux that, hopefully you'll see through tasting these wines this afternoon is you've got a very very old region um, but the quality is not sitting still the quality is getting better and better um, and in one of the the regions that produces the finest wines in the world to see them making um, such monumental strides forward in quality you know you have to just be amazed as to where the ceiling for this is um, but yeah that, that's a stunning wine what do you reckon Regan? A bit of a dark horse this wine Liz I think it's, it's super underrated by the market like we don't sell a huge amount of it on premier um, it dribbles off the shelf um, but 
every vintage I've ever tried, I've been impressed by, and this is this is no exception. This is absolutely awesome wine, um, mm. and it's it's typical Grave as well. Like you said, it's exactly what you want from a wine of this region. Um, and if you compare it to some of the uh, the other the other wines in this uh, this area, like a say like a Le Mission or an Aubryon, it is very very close to Le Mission in quality, and it's less than half the price. You know, it's uh, it, it's stunning. Mm. Yeah, I think that's exactly the thing is I think, you know, if you look at this lineup and, you know, if you'd looked at it beforehand and sort of gone, you know, why, why is Smith Hole feet in there? And that would have been a really fair thing to ask. It's in here because we know the qualities at this level. And it's one of these wines that, you know, we hope in um, this lineup is going to show you, a, give you a surprise um, and show you that it can stand up well and truly beside these other wines. Yeah, and an incredible longevity, I think, on this wine as well. I Actually, I think Stephen's just mentioned that benefit for some more time to fully integrate. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, this is that kind of time period, I think, where young Bordeaux shows quite good. It's quite drinkable, um, and it shows you what's, what's to come. Um, but give this another five or six years and it's just going to close down. And I think, I think Jeb's note in there that I included said this will do 30 or 40 years in a good cellar. And I, yeah, no problemo. You could drink this wine at 40 years of age and I think it'd be incredible. Very good. Everyone mark it in your diaries for 40 years from now. <laughs> we'll, be on, we'll be on COVID um, 36 by then. <laughs> oh very good okay so what we're going to do now uh is move to the next flight of wines um so what we'll do is we'll just give everyone a couple of minutes to pour the next four wines if you haven't already uh and then we will move on to those Wow, that, that Smith Olafit is awesome. I just finished it off there and the, the length is just immense. Also, we need to apologize to some of you out there. Um, we've realized that there was one batch of the uh, booklets that have gone out with some very strange uh, printing. So uh, and if you're, uh, and uh, mine is one of them. So if you're having to turn it this way and that way, apologies for that. The last batch obviously didn't get uh, checked hard enough. So just to make sure that you're uh, you're still paying attention to find the right wine in there. <laughs> I said to Regan, it's um it's our way of making sure that you know everyone's got their brains still engaged during lockdown. It's giving you a little bit of a trivia um, <laughs> last bunch bun <laughs> done after sampling. Yeah, very possibly, Stephen. Very possibly the issue. Cool. Okay. Can we have some thumbs up if we've got people ready with the next flight or do you need a couple of minutes? Okay. We've got a couple of thumbs up there. Yep. Okay. Very good. Over to you, Regan. Right. Well, we're moving to Margot. So as you can see, if you remember the, the Bordeaux map from the start there, we've started off on the right bank. We've gone, we've gone Pomerol, saint Emilion. Now we've moved around to the bottom underneath Bordeaux City Grave, and now we're starting to move up the Medoc. And the first of the uh, Appalachians we come to um, as we move up there is, is Margot. Um, and Chateau Bran Cantonac um, is actually a second growth um, in the, uh, the 1855 classification. Uh, and the estate really started off in the, the early 17th century. Uh, and it was known for a very, very long time as Domaine Gwilym Hostan. Uh, and even at that, that those days, um, wine was produced from the property. Uh, uh, and the, the vineyards yeah. and the estate weren't really developed until the late 1700s by the Gorse family. And back then in the 1700s, the wine was so highly regarded, it was one of um, the more expensive wines in all of Bordeaux. Uh, it sold for almost the same price uh, as a wine called Bran Mouton, uh, now known as Mouton Rothschild. 
Now, that's really interesting because of who went on to eventually buy the vineyard uh, in the 1800s. And it was brought by um, a guy called the Baron of Bran. Um, you might recognize that name, uh, Baron de Bran is the, the name of the second wine of Brian Cantonac. Uh, he was not only known as the Baron of Bran, he was also known as the Napoleon of the vineyards. Now he purchased the estate in um, 1833. And at the time he brought it, it was called Chateau Gorse Guy. As we've seen, there's been a lot of name changes with these chateaus um, over the years. Now, funnily enough, in order to obtain the funds needed to buy this estate, the Baron sold Chateau Mouton Rothschild, uh, known at the time as Bran Mouton. So he thought that he would much rather have Bran Cantonac than Mouton Rothschild. That's the kind of um, acclaim that this was held at um, at the time. So he renamed the property um, in 1838 and he merged his name with the name of the sector where the vineyards were located. So when he brought it, it was Chateau Gorse Guy. Uh, he was the Baron of Bran, and it was in the Cantonac sector of Margot. So he renamed it Chateau Bran Cantonac. So that's where the, uh, the name came from originally here. Uh, now, jumped through kind of various owners um, over the next kind of century or so uh, until the Lurton family. Um, Francois Lurton originally, he took over Brian Cantonac along with Chateau Margot um, and his son inherited it in 1956 and it's been in the hands of the, the Lurton family um, ever since. So since 1925, I think they've owned it um, and Lucien's um, been in charge since 1956. Uh, and it's been run for a very, very long time by Henri Lurton, who is a very, very famous man um, in Bordeaux. And it was under his kind of direction that these large portions of the vineyard were replanted, vine densities increased, um, all the drainage system was pulled up and redone, and the plantings were slowly changed to the plantings that they've kind of got at the moment. So they've now got about a, a vineyard of about 75 hectares, and it's planted in 55% uh, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, 39% Merlot, 4.5% uh, Cab Franc, 1% Petit Verdot, and 0.5% Carmenere. Now the Carmenere, the first vintage uh, that was put in was the 2011 vintage. Um, the Petit Verdot was planted in 2008, and the first vintage that was included was 2017. Um, so they have been changing the plantings here quite a bit. But the, the vineyard itself, or the plot, that 75 hectare plot, that's essentially unchanged um, since it earned that second growth status in 1855. So um, there's 120 different parcels. And of the um, 75 hectares um, of the vineyard, 45 hectares uh, are used to produce this wine, the Grand Balm. And those parcels are all really, really close to the chateau. Uh, and they're right in front of the, the Cantonac Plateau, the original old plateau. And that's the best terroir that the, um, the chateau owns. Now, at its highest kind of point, uh, the vineyard's got an elevation of 22 meters, and that parcels the heart and kind of soul of the vineyard, uh, not just for the elevation, but also the depth of the gravel that they've got there, uh, which is about 12 meters deep um, at its deepest. And there's, there's no soil, it's just straight gravel all the way down uh, for 12 meters. They do have some other parcels in Margot that are further inland, but almost all of that goes into the second wine. Uh, it doesn't go into the, the Grand Barn itself. Um, pretty, pretty heavy density plantings, uh, 6,666 vines per hectare uh, on the plateau uh, and up to 8,000 vines per hectare for the vines located that are behind the chateau that are on the more kind of sandy style soils. And these, these really high density plantings, um, this is kind of uh, an experiment for them and those are all of the newer planting vines. Um, so that they're trying up there. Um, they're also doing a lot of um, organic farming here. Um, so about 20% of the, the vineyards are farmed organically now. And it's expected that over time, that's just going to increase and, and increase. Um, currently, they've got four hectares being farmed completely biodynamically as well. So they're also doing some experimentation with that. And we're going to expect to see that increase over time as well. Um, so they've had some... Uh, Couple of big modifications in modern times, huge modification in 1999 um, in the Chai, and another big one in 2015 with a complete renovation of the cellar uh, and the vat rooms as well. Now, 
they're still a pretty traditional producer, but they were also one of the first estates um, on the left bank to embrace um, optical sorting and reverse osmosis, you know, which takes some of the water out of the wine in a really, really wet vintage. So they've always kind of been at the forefront of technology, but the style of their wine has been um, reasonably traditional. So if you haven't already, because I haven't yet, let's uh, give it a taste. Mm. Wow, and that's everything you're looking for in a Margot. So Margot, I mean, has some of the most loveliest, um, most delicate, most elegant wines um, in all of Bordeaux, um, particularly um, well known for the aroma, that delicate aroma or that Margot perfume that we see is really, really noticeable on the nose here. Um, so here we're, we're kind of south of the, the Madoc at some of the thinnest soils um, in the whole region here in Margot. Um, that perfume, a lot of that comes from the gravel. You've got always in a good Margot, you've got those kind of lighter red fruits, not so much of the, uh, uh, the dark fruits. It's almost a haunting um, kind of flavor to it as well. Uh, now, in this year here, in this particular wine, um, 2018, they said it was a really special year for them because of the high threat of mildew. They had to be really vigilant uh, to combat that disease, um, trying to uh, follow the most natural kind of style that they could while also avoiding excessive use of copper, um, which is good for mildew, but high doses of that can sterilize the soil. Uh, but then they had this exceptional summer, obviously, as we had in 2018. Uh, and the vines here didn't suffer during the dry period because they had those really high groundwater reserves down deep in the gravels, uh, thanks to um, uh, all of that heavy, heavy rain over the winter before. Um, average age of the vines they've got here is uh, 35 years. And in 2018, this is 55% Cabernet Sauvignon, 40% uh, Merlot, 4% Cab Franc, 0.5% um, Petit Verdot and 0.5% Carmenere. Uh, and it's interesting, the Carmenere and not so much the Petit Verdot because we, we have seen small quantities of that in Bordeaux for a, for a long time, but seeing Carmenere uh, in a Grand Van on the left bank um, is certainly a little bit unusual, but we're going to see more of this in the future as with global warming, as Bordeaux heats up, um, the Carmenere does much better in those conditions than some of the traditional varieties. And, and um, funnily enough, uh, if we all know, Carmenere originally was a Bordeaux variety. Uh, most of it was pulled out during phylloxera. And one of the only places it survived was in South America, uh, where they thought it was Merlot for a very, very long time. Um, so it's good to see Carmenere starting to have a small resurgence in Bordeaux. And I think we'll see more of that in the future as well. Um, this uh, obviously all aged in, um, in French oak, 18 months, a lot of new oak here. This is 70% new oak. Um, doesn't seem like it when you smell this wine or when you taste this wine at all. Uh, it absolutely just soaks it up. Now, here on the left bank, we're seeing a much lower alcohol level than we saw in some of those right bank wines. This is 13.5%. Uh, and that comes through on the palate as well, I think. But it's a beautifully balanced wine. Uh, and you've got these lovely kind of grainy tannins to it as well um, that give it an elegance, matches really nicely with that Margot perfume. I mean, this, they think this is a wine that's going to have a, a huge aging potential for them. Um, one thing with Margot is because the wines are kind of lighter and more delicate, people often think they won't age as long. Well, that's certainly not the case. They just retain this kind of this lightness uh, and this delicacy as they age. Mm. Beautiful sweet fruit, and it's almost it's almost chewy and concentrated on the palate. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a great comment here that um, you know it's very pretty and elegant, um, particularly after the, the previous ones. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> and Anne Marie, you'd like another top up? Yes, we need we we need to be back um, at tastings in person so that we can do that. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, you know, it, 
we've jumped to another area and we've again shown, you know, almost a, a textbook example of what um, that area is about. And, you know, I think we've seen that through all of the wines that we've tasted so far. Um, unfortunately, I think we're about to throw the textbook out the window, <laughs> um, but um, we'll come to that story. Yeah, that's Very just, good. it's textbook Margot that, I really yeah. like that one. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it is. So on that, we might um, move on. Um, and what we are doing next, um, let me just get you back to some pictures. Sorry, my, mul my multitasking here is clearly not working that well. <laughs> Getting there. Right, we now of course are moving to our second glass in this flight and are moving to Ponte Canet. And why I said, you know, we're probably going to throw the textbook out um, at this wine is because I think when you taste this, what you will see first and foremost is that it is Ponte Canet. Um, you are most definitely not looking at a wine that you would class as being um, you know, exactly what you would expect from Poyak, um, because it has a very strong signature um, of producer over it. So we'll come to have a look at the wine um, and talk a bit more about that, but just a little bit of uh, history, first of all, on Ponte Canet. So the name itself actually relates um, to its ownership over the years. So the Ponte part of its name comes from a former owner who was actually the royal governor um, of the Medoc. Uh, Jean-Francois de Ponte. Um, and he owned a lot of land in um, Pouillac and he was um, well known for uh, a thirst for land ownership um, in the area. And after he died, his sons continued with that and they purchased another um, part of land in um, Pouillac, but also in the Canet area. So with the two bits of land, they then decided the combination for the chateau would be Ponte Canet, joining together the two names. Of course, in the 1855 classification, um, Ponte Canet was classified and it was classified as a fifth growth. It was a very, very large estate at that time, 81 hectares, and caught the attention of the Cruz family that were a negotiant business at the time and they noticed that it had been classified and um, a, a large property and obviously saw the commercial prospects there and in 1865 purchased it. And impressively, they held on to it for a hundred years. And it was in 1975 that Guy Tesseron purchased it. And over um, its history, it's in fact only had three different owners. And that is very, very unusual in Bordeaux. We usually see a lot more ownership than three because it is the Tesseron family that still own it today. When the Tesseron family um, took it over in 1975, uh, it was in a very, very poor state. It was very run down. Um, the family, of course, famous for their cognac, um, which if you're a follower of our Tesseron cognac, You'll be very pleased to know uh, that we had a container arrive at our warehouse yesterday uh, and it has cognac in it. We're very excited. Has some other things in it as well, which we're excited by, but there is plenty of Tesseron cognac for Christmas. Um, so they still have their cognac business. They also own another property um, in Bordeaux and they have La Fon Roche in Saint Steph. Now, what happened in 1994 is probably written um, a new path for Ponte Canet because that was when Alfred Tesseron took over management of the property. And Alfred, um, he's um, you know, a very, very charming person. We've been obviously fortunate enough to have Alfred visit us. In fact, uh, he visited us, we did what was planned and I still remember he said to me one day, he said, I've rung my secretary. And I said to him, you know, that's lovely, but you know, where's this going, Alfred? He said, I made her change my plane tickets. He said, I'm not going home yet. And I remember I must have had this look of 
um, sort of horror and delight on my face all at once uh, because he then told me that I needed to organize another two days of visits for him and what we needed to be doing. Um, so uh, anyway, we had another wonderful two days and he absolutely adores this country. Um, but anyway, Alfred um, set about in 1994 um, to lift um, Ponte Cane from being considered as a fifth growth, which he never thought it were, was at all, um, to sitting very comfortably alongside the second growths. When you consider who their neighbours are, Alfred's aspirations are a lot higher than even where they are at today because this is a property that sits right beside Mouton Rothschild. And, you know, when you visit there, Alfred often sort of refers to his neighbours and goes, oh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, they make some okay wine. But it, it's clear he's, um, he's got big aspirations. So much so that in 2004, he started converting the property to organic. And um, Ponte Cane is the first of the large properties in Bordeaux to have converted 100%. So from 2010 vintage, 100% organic, um, and they're now, of course, biodynamic as well. But you will never see that referenced on the label. The reason for doing it is not, um, not to have organic or biodynamic um, on the label to sell the wine or as a badge or anything like that. Um, it's, it's because they believe that is the way to make the best wine possible. Now, I can see Regan's note there that this is unlike any other Ponte Canais ever tasted. Yeah, I probably need to explain how we've made this because it is very, very different. So I'll keep going for a little bit and then we'll come to tasting it. Um, just a note as well, uh, the Tesseron family have increased uh, what they're doing and purchased another vineyard, um, but their latest purchase in 2016 was not in France, uh, but was in fact in the Napa Valley. And they, produce, they purchased the Lake Robin Williams um, vineyard, which is known as Pimray. And we will be having that wine um, in New Zealand. I think it probably will land early next year. So why is Ponte Cane taste so very, very different? What are they doing here? Well, one of the things that they've done is um, starts in the vineyard. And in fact, if you talk to Alfred, although he's, trained in winemaking, he will say that he always wanted to be a farmer and it's not about winemaking, it's about what you grow and all the work is done in the vineyard. They do a lot of things that are very, very different. So they don't green harvest or leaf thin or do anything that most properties would do, but rather they go through and reduce the buds per vine. So they do it at that point. It's very, from there then on, very non-intervention um, in terms of what they do in the vineyard. Um, everything is done to try and keep um, minimal sort of impact to the vines. Uh, they use horses extensively through the property. And in fact, they've just completed the building of um, some new stables and there's now 20 horses. Um, and with the stables, they've actually put above the stables um, some residents for the workers because um, they, they believe with biodynamics that it's not um, just about vineyards and just about making wine, but the people that are involved are part of that entire circle and looking after the workers and housing them and feeding them and having essentially their own village there at Ponte Cane is very, very important. Um, they don't look at each row or each part of the vineyard and look at what they need to do to treat that. They look at each individual vine. And with that, that's a huge amount of attention to detail and care. They generally have a very low yield um, and it's always sub 35 hectolitres per hectare. This particular year, it's very, very low though and we'll come to that. 
They have 92 different plots through the vineyard, an average vine age of 45 years. And um, the vine density is nine and a half thousand vines per hectare. So in terms of the wine making here, um, let me just have a little taste of it. I had a little taste before, but I'll go back to it now before I talk to you about what they're doing. Yep, exactly as I expected it would be. They have a new winery and they use some of the new winery for 2017, but 2018 was the first vintage where everything was done um, in this new winery. Um, and sorry, I'll just flick through, there we go. So there's Alfred uh, and his lovely horses there. Um, so everything was done in the new winery and the new winery, there's just so much to tell you about it. But one of the things that you notice when you go in there is there's no power sockets because the entire process is now done without the use of electricity. So what they've done is they've got some boreholes in the vineyard and they're using geothermal energy to run the lighting in um, the winery. They've got rid of all pumps, everything electronic, nothing is electrical through the entire thing, including how they de-stem the grapes. So they're using um, something that probably in New Zealand um, will recall having seen at Pyramid Valley, if you had visited there during vintage, is they're using, it's essentially a mesh, so like chicken wire, and you put the grapes on top of it and rub them over it and just the berries will drop through the wire and it's hand manual de-stemming of um, the bunches. So very, very labor intensive. The fermentation is all in some conical shaped um, wood and concrete tanks. And then the aging is in French oak, which is um, usually about 50% new, and amphora. And amphora up until this vintage has been around 25% of the vintage. But what's really unique in 2018 is their yield was 12 hectolitres per hectare. It's a tiny, tiny yield they have under 25% of what they would normally produce. They put 45% of the wine into amphora. So in this particular year, this barrel hall would have been very, very empty because they had 25% of their normal yield and then they put almost half of it into amphora. So they didn't use the barrels at all. They just would have sat there empty. They also used 100% cement vats for the fermentation of this. And the blend, 70% Cabernet, 22% Merlot, 5% Cabernet Franc, and 3% uh, Petit Verdot. So a very, very different wine. And I think when you look at it, there's the cement vats. And that's, in fact, the new cellar. And this lighting is that um, geothermal energy lighting um, that I talked about before. So the entire way through this, there's no electricity at all and everything is moving by gravity um, so that there's nothing mechanical at all in the entire um, production. So in terms of Regan, why it's so different, I think, you know, if we had to look at Bordeaux and look at a wine where there's no intervention and everything is being done very naturally and I don't really want to use the term natural because I think that would be wrong uh, but you very clearly could. Uh, just unmute yourself there Regan. I'd be happy to drink this in a natural uh, wine bar on K Road Liz. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I don't know what their criteria is. Depends which one you're in. Um, but yeah, it fits it. It's, um, yeah, 
But I think, you know, there's been a lot written about this particular wine um, because if you looked at it in a blind tasting and said, pick out the Poyac, this is not characteristic of Poyac. This is characteristic of Ponte Canet. And it goes against everything that we're going to see in the rest of these wines and that we've seen so far. Um, but, you know, it's just a producer going out of their way to do everything they can as naturally low intervention, striving for the best quality possible and working to try and have no impact on the environment in which they're working within. So I'm, we've only got Regan's um, comments so far. I'm interested what others thought of it. No, it's, a, it's incredible. I, that's, that's probably the most, most interesting and no, it's the greatest Ponte Cane I've ever tried. It's, it's like, no, but I, I don't even know if it's like Ponte Cane because Ponte is an interesting wine for me. Since they've started this change, you know, one thing that I've noticed with the wine is that every vintage uh, has a very distinct character, right? Which is so, which is more Ponte in that vintage than it is Ponte alone. Like you often don't see the same characters from year to year in Ponte because they're, they're constantly evolving and they're trying to get better and they're working towards a goal that they haven't yet got to yet. And this is almost the most, uh, striking example of it yet i mean there were some vintages where they first started using those amphora where it had a really like mediterranean kind of olive tapenade character to it like you'd see in a in a super tuscan you know like a sasakaya or something uh but i mean this vintage there's none of that at all and there's way more amphora use but then you've got the amphora and the combination of those incredibly low yields that, i mean like like this note says from galoni i mean the the richness and the concentration and the intensity is just off the charts it's like insane yeah it's just all just squashed in there and distilled and it's still got all of this minerality and all of this drive and these super silky tannins it's yeah it's a crazy wine i like how he's described it as um if uh la lubie's loire made bordeaux because yeah it's uh it, it's out there it's yeah and, and it's not poyac it's 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 its own thing Mental. Yeah, it is. And I think, um, you know, just to answer some of the questions that have come up there. Um, so is Alfred an innovator or just eccentric? Um, <laughs> one thing I would say is he's very considered. He comes across as being eccentric. Um, but when you talk to him, everything he's doing, he has a reason for it, a purpose for doing it and knows you know knows what he's doing um the eccentric part perhaps comes through i think a bit more in that he's often criticized for not having respect for tradition and not having respect for tradition in the market uh and you know he's he's probably the first to go yep yeah, but the market needs to change I don't really care if they don't think I have respect for it. Um, so I think the answer probably, Glenn, to that is from the wine side, I think probably an innovator, but in terms of disruption in the market, perhaps a bit eccentric. So a bit of both. Um, and then the comments there on, you know, the herbal nature of it, the tannins. I think the tannins particularly are coming from um, that M4. Um, and you do like watching the evolution of Ponte over the years, the tannin structures changed to a lot of what we're seeing in that glass when they moved to using M4. And this is the highest level of it that we've seen. Um, and the sweetness, I think, coming through there, just that comment, this is a really ripe vintage. Um, the fact that we're seeing any freshness in these wines is just remarkable. And that's the skill of the um, producers for sure. Um, if you're sitting there and going, how will this age? Um, I think the first one that I saw from Ponte that had gone, you know, over to the spectrum of where they've headed now, I was a bit concerned and sort of thought to myself, you know, is this going to be the same as what Ponte has been in the past in terms of its aging capacity? We are seeing that these wines can and do age. This one's the most extreme they've done. We're not going to know for a few years what its evolution is going to be.
but I suspect everything is there that's going to see this develop into an absolutely spectacular wine. Right. Everyone, yeah, very polarizing. I do agree. <laughs> right, Regan, should we move on? I think we shall. Oh. Can you hear me? There we go. Oh, you can hear me. Right, okay. Um, Kelong Segur. And uh, uh, Kelong Segur, um, obviously um, also not, not a, a second growth wine, um, a third growth estate. Uh, but a very, very historic estate. So we're moving north again uh, in the Medoc. Um, so we're moving up to St. Estef. And obviously the most famous um, second growth estate in St. Estef, probably um, Cosdair Starnel um, or, or, or Chateau Montrose. Um, both of those I considered putting in this tasting, uh, but both of those we don't have enough wine to put in this tasting um, because we sold most of it on Premier. Uh, but it's very, very difficult to, uh, to go past this vintage of Cologne Segur because this is possibly the best vintage of Cologne um, that they've ever made. Uh, I haven't tasted it yet, so before I tell you about it, let's, let's have a taste and, and see what we've got here in the glass. So I've smelt it a bit and the nose is, is awesome. Mm. The only reason I swallowed that is that I have to tell you guys something about this wine because otherwise I would have just kept that going and going and going because, well, the length of that is immense. Um, that's probably the most elegant and refined vintage of Cologne Segur I've ever tried. Uh, but it's also one of the most concentrated. And one of the things about St. Estef is we usually expect uh, it to be a, a little bit rustic, a little bit rough on the tannins. And there is none of that in that wine there. That is um, sensational. Um, the historic records at Cologne Segur show that um, this estate was in existence as far back as um, 1147. And it was owned, funnily enough, at that time by a guy called the Monsignor de Calon. And he was a really important uh, bishop in Bordeaux. And so this makes this a contender for probably the oldest property in all of St. Estef. Uh, now, eventually, this property uh, came to be owned uh, by Nicolas Alexandre de Segur. And that's where that name, Calon Segur, comes from. Uh, now, it passed down a number of generations of the Segur family and eventually became the property of the famous Marquis de Segur. And he's a really important figure in Bordeaux history. Uh, because he's owned a number of the top Bordeaux estates um, of the day. Um, he also owned Chateau Lafitte and Chateau La Tour. And he was credited with uttering the words um, that spawned the idea behind this heart-shaped logo that we see on the label here. And the way the legend goes is the Marquis um, uh, de Segur was quoted as saying that, I make my wine at Lafitte and La Tour, but my heart is in Cologne. Uh, and that lives on um, with, the, with the label that we see here. Uh, in the 19th century, they engraved the heart uh, on the facade of the cellars um, just after um, uh, they, they were classified in the 1855 classification. And the heart first appeared at the beginning of, on the label at the beginning of the 20th century. That was when the first labels were created. Before that time, uh, Bordeaux bottles didn't really have labels on them. Uh, in fact, most of the time, um, they were shipped off in barrel to negotiants um, around the world in London or in Belgium where they were bottled themselves at that time. So the heart itself first appeared um, not until the 20th century. Uh, now, this is one of the, the three original Bordeaux vineyards in St. Estef. So um, if we look back to kind of 1825, where Chateau Monrose is today was a, a forest, completely forested area, not even cultivated by, by, by vines. And the... Um, the Cologne Segur estate was a massive estate. Um, it was uh, the Segur family owned um, huge holdings. They owned all the way up from where uh, Cologne Segur is in Saint Estef, uh, running all the way down um, into what later became Lafitte Rothschild, 
uh, Latour, Mouton, Rothschild, they owned all of this upper part uh, of the Madoc, the Segur family. Now, the kind of the modern period uh, began in 1894 uh, when the, the vineyards were purchased by uh, George Gaston uh, and Charles Hanapier, and he was a large negotiant um, at the time. Um, and it was sold most recently, I think in 2012, uh, for 170 million euros. And those are the kind of prices that we're seeing Bordeaux estates go for these days. Um, I mean, that was quite some time ago as well. And was bought by a large French insurance company, as we've seen a lot of things happen, uh, a company called uh, Sura Veneer Insurance. So uh, Jean-Pierre Moex, um, they also took a, a small stake, a minority stake. So they owned a little bit of, um, of Colon Segur. And since these guys bought it in 2012, they started a serious program of renovating the property, massive focus on the winemaking facilities. Uh, and obviously the trend in Bordeaux is now to vinify on a, a parcel by parcel basis. You don't blend them together. So they replaced all of the older vats with new stainless steel, uh, varying in size and number to match all of those parcels in the vineyard. Brand new vat room, uh, everything moves by gravity here as well. There's no pumps. Um, they, they cut over the top of it, put a massive skylight into the cellar as well. Uh, and they also began extensive planting um, of the vineyards. They wanted to increase the, the vine density and they wanted to add more Cabernet Sauvignon into the vineyard. So just the renovation uh, that they're doing since they bought it uh, is expected to cost between 20 million and 40 million euros in renovation costs. Uh, they also um, bought a number of new estates. I think in 2020, they bought uh, Vrai Coy de Gay in Pomerol, Chateau Sirac in Le de Pomerol, and Chateau Prieur in Saint Emilion as well. So they've got plenty of money. Now, the interesting thing about the vineyard here, uh, and you can see a shot of it there, is that massive wall that runs around it. So the vineyard itself is, is 55 hectares, um, and it was 55 hectares, which is 136 um, acres. In 1855, it's 55 hectares today. Um, so it's exactly the same size as it was in 1855. And almost all of it is enclosed within this massive wall. So it's a rare example of kind of consistency of, of terroir um, throughout the centuries, basically, uh, which we don't see very often at all. Uh, now the plantings are 53% Cabernet, 38% Merlot, 7% Cab Franc and 2% uh, Petit Verdot. Uh, now the goal of the owners basically at the moment is to try and uh, decrease that percentage of, of Merlot uh, and increase the percentage of Cabernet Sauvignon um, in its place, which is more similar to how it was kind of planted in previous generations. Um, you've got various kind of densities here, uh, but it's not as full as some of the vineyards in the Madoc and they're trying to change that. So. Um, they had about 20 hectares that when they brought it in 2012 were planted as low as 5,900 vines per hectare and they're trying to get that up to 8,000 vines per hectare. Uh, now, as an example, Marlborough uh, is planted at around 3,500 vines per hectare. So they brought this at 5,900, which is almost double Marlborough. And they were like, well, that's, that's way too, too uh, widely planted. We need to, to, to really mix these up. And they're going for 8,000. So um, I think this is one of the only walled vineyards um, pretty much in all of Bordeaux of this size. It's also the most northernmost uh, classified growth in the, in the Medoc. They've got two little parcels of vines that are outside of the wall. Um, and those are also used for the Grand Vine because they've traditionally been very, very good. Um, most of the vineyard that was within the wall uh, that heads down and slopes down slightly down towards um, uh, the Gironde. And we're just north of the village of um, St. Estef here. Um, vineyard kind of elevation, we're ranging from about kind of two, three meters above sea level down by the, um, uh, by the Gironde itself up to about 33 meters above sea level um, up at the higher parts of the plateau. Peak elevation is kind of up near the chateau itself. And you've got three, three different blocks with these kind of hills and slopes with about 60 different um, parcels. And it's, it's gravel, rocks, clay, limestone soils. And the gravel is kind of five to six meters deep. Uh, and average age of the vines is about 30 years of age. Um, 
And the only reason that's so young is due to this replanting program that they've, they've got going on. But they do have some very old vines, which are more in that kind of 45 to 60 year uh, of age thing. Um, apparently the property is very, very diff difficult to find because there's not many signs because uh, the prior owner was not very fond of visitors, which is quite interesting. I don't know if um, you visited there, Liz, but that was one of the interesting things I noticed about this. Now, um, when they've, uh, they're making this wine, they completed the new wine making facility in 2016 after this kind of multi-year renovation. So all the fermentation takes place in these um, 70 kind of cone-shaped stainless steel tanks. And they range from like 25 hectoliters to 120 hectoliters. So the reason they're such different sizes is they want every parcel to go into a separate tank. They don't want any blending. And so they've got all of these different tanks of different sizes. Um, now, oak-wise, uh, we've got a lot of new oak in this wine. Um, sometimes between 90% new oak um, and 100% new oak. Um, in this particular year, in 2018, it had 20 months in 100% new barrels. Um, so that, I think this is the only wine we've tried here that's been a 100% new oak um, wine. Obviously, everything all hand-picked here. Um, they, they do vibration sorting and hand sorting. Uh, no optical kind of sorting here. Um, the final blend this year in 2018 was 57% Cab Sav, 34% Merlot, 7% Franc and 2% Petit Verdot. And we're going to see that continue to kind of increase over time, that percentage of, um, of uh, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. But this has always been, Kilong, a, a really powerful, uh, really tannic wine that needs um, a lot of time to kind of soften, often, you know, 20 years or more. Um, and lots of old, old vintages that are drinking really good, like the 2000 is drinking awesomely right now at, at 20 years old. But all of those older vintages um, are perhaps more, more masculine, you know, uh, more tannic, more structured, more traditional Saint Estef in their textures. You know, they had big, uh, grainy, brawny tannins to them. I mean, it was a real traditional Saint Estef uh, and it took time to become civilized. But um, since these guys took over in 2012, especially since maybe the 2015 vintage, uh, the wines have become um, a lot more civilized, a lot more elegant than the Calon Segurs have passed. And we can see this here. I mean, this wine is incredibly concentrated, um, but everything about it is really refined at the same time as well. They're a little bit softer, um, lusher, riper, more forward, more purity of fruit. I mean, dramatically better wines. I mean, the best vintages of Cologne Segur are all modern vintages, probably like 15, 16, um, 18, 19, 20. You know, I mean, the nine and the 10 are, are really good. The 05 is good, the 2000 good, but those are all in the older style. Whereas now the wines are much more modern. And I think we're really getting a good example of this in this class. Yeah, yeah I, I think Regamus is a property that, um, you know, it's always one that's sold very, very well for us. But I think the quality that we're seeing now and the quality that we're going to see with what they're doing there, it's one to follow for sure. Um, you know, it's looking really, really good this afternoon, and I think that would age beautifully. Um, of course, we'll we'll come to the availability of some of these wines at the end of a tasting, uh, but don't get too excited about wanting to drink this this year. <laughs> would be <laughs> what I would say. <laughs> yeah. Though, just as an example, um, in terms of yields, we we talked a lot about yields at um, Ponte Canet. The target yield for Cologne Segur is 45 hectoliters per hectare. Uh, in 2018, I think they were down under 30. Um, now about 30 is what Ponte is targeting with their biodynamics and they were at 10 to 12 in 2018. So that's why um, you've got that like intense Kirsch style fruit in the Ponte Canet because like those yields are just, I mean, they're uneconomical basically. It does also with Ponte mean there's there's just not much of it around the whole world. No. So it's it's a year that's been highly regarded 
for a lot of wines, including Ponte, and then there's just none of it. So, mm. right, brilliant wine. Thank you, Regan. Um, is everyone ready for the last wine? Yeah, <laughs> it's been quite a stellar lineup. It's I definitely can't say, you know, we've saved the best for last because we've just got so many good wines here. Um, but we certainly do have a very, very good property um, to finish the tasting on. So we'll just get um, to the current slide. Right. So we're now moving to Leoville Las Cas. So Leoville Las Cas, um, it has quite a noble history and a very long history to it. 1638, uh, Jean de Monti, uh, he was a member of the Bordeaux Parliament, um, owned it, and actually it wasn't called uh, Leoville and it wasn't called Las Cas, it was Mont uh, Monti, uh, and actually it was one of the first chateaux along with Margot and Latour, but not under the name of Latour at that stage, to produce wine in the Bordeaux region. It was in the same family ownership for more than a hundred years. And then it changed ownership and under the new owner became known as um, Leoville, or uh, it was actually referred to affectionately as Leonville. And we can see the little lion at the top there. It's always been a very, very large property in saint julien and when Alexandra, the then owner, died, it was 300 hectares. Following the French Revolution, um, a large portion of it was sold. And at that stage, uh, it became Leoville Baton. 1840, there was more divisions, and we ended up with Leoville Lascas, Leoville Baton, and Leoville Porphyry. And Regan, you talk about visiting a chateau and finding it hard to get there. And yes, Calon is hard to find. Um, but Leoville Baton, Leoville Lascars, and Leoville Poffery all share a common car park. And trying to work out which is the entrance to each one of them is quite tricky. But it's also quite good if you put your appointments for all three uh, in succession, because then you just have to go from one door to the next. Quite often I tend to have us though visiting Leoville Lascas, then driving to Calon Segur, then back to Leoville Baton, and then somewhere else before we go to Leoville Porphyry. But anyway, they are all um, very, very close together. In the 19th century, um, and you can see them all lined up there, so they're all side by side there. In the 19th century, in fact, 1901, the ownership changed and it changed to the Delon family. 1976 to 2000, it was Michel de Leon who was looking after it, after it, and he sadly passed away in 2000, and his son has taken over ownership since then. Leba Lascas, um, since then, and under this family's ownership, has really gone to a, a new level. It, it's a very prestigious property anyway but the current quality coming out of Leo Velasquez is simply incredible. Uh, the Dion family also own a number of other properties. So under the same um, ownership, we have Chateau Ninan, Chateau Potensac, and Claude de Marquis. And Claude de Marquis is often confused as the second wine of Leo Velasquez. It actually comes from its own um, vineyards, so is not the second wine. Um, the second wine was introduced in 2007 and is Le Petit Lyon de Marquis de Lascas. Um, so a confusing name with the Marquis in there, which is why Claude de Marquis often gets confused in with it. It's a 95 hectare vineyard today, um, the largest of the three Leoville properties. And the heart of it actually borders um, with Puyac and with Chateau Latour. There's seven main parcels um, that they, sorry, seven main blocks broken up into 125 different parcels. Now, in complete contrast to what we talked about with Chateau Ponte Canet, where we talked a lot about innovation, here the winemaking is very, very traditional. The fermentation is in wood, and you can see um, the vessels there, some of those very, very old. They also use concrete and some stainless steel. Interestingly, they blend after malolactic 
and before putting their wines into barrels for aging. Um, so they do believe that actually tasting the wines at that stage and letting the winemakers understand what the parcels look like before they see the influence of oak blends them a better wine. Since 1987, they've been using reverse osmosis. So what Regan um, referred to before is the technique of extracting water from the must. It's very controversial in Bordeaux, um, but they, they are using it. They do state very categorically that they are not using it in all vintages. They are using it where it is required in wet vintages. But what it does do is it concentrates um, the wine. 1988, um, they withdrew themselves from the Council de Grand Cru. They would withdraw themselves from the 1855 classification if they were allowed to, but they're not, it's law. But they've very much um, decided that they want to stand on their own two feet. And I guess uh, a little bit critical of the fact that they're not, um, uh, classified at the very top of the region. So they've just said, well, we're, we're going to go our own path and make the very best wine that we can. In terms of this vintage, um, let's just have a little taste about it, of it, if you. Mm. Yeah, it's absolutely epic. The, the tannin structure is just incredible yeah you can see why with these guys when you talk about them that you know they've just thrown everything out the door and gone there's one goal and that is the best wine we can produce um and i think you know i've been trying las gas now on premier for um it's over 10 years and watched the quality go up and I remember tasting this one on Premier and walking away going that just has to be the best wine um, that I've tasted today and I, I think seeing it now in the bottle um, it's still as glorious as it was when it was a young wine. The owner um, Atlas Gas um, has a lovely comparison he says that his 2016 which was a highly regarded wine compares for him to the 1961. The 2018 compares to the 1959. So if that has any relevance to anyone, but I think what it does do is tells us that as the owner of these wines and with the history of what the old ones taste like, he can see that these are going to be very long lived wines. Um, the blend is 80% Cabernet, an impressive 11 point percent Cabernet Franc and 9% Merlot and the Franc is reasonably high in this one. Um, the yield 35.5 hectolitres, they would normally average about um, 42 um, hectolitres I think um, and if you want the very exact alcohol um, percentage on this one it is 14.49 percent to be very precise. <laughs> So, and I can see the comments um, coming through there uh, that this is just a marvelous claret and a step up and that we've less, left the best one um, for the last. Yeah, I think we, we certainly have put a very, very good wine on the end of that tasting. But I think when you look back through the tasting this afternoon and, you know, lovely comment there um, about the quality of all of the wines this afternoon, um, and Amory, I'm very interested that you took your uh, lids off earlier, um, smart idea. Um, but I think the quality of all of them has hopefully shown you that the 2018 vintage, it lives up to everything that's been written about it and all the hype. You know, this is an exceptionally good vintage um, for Bordeaux. We've seen a huge amount of diversity through the wines, um, but we've seen wines that are very representative and reflective and show a high level of typicity of the place that they're growing. I think the outlier is, of course, the Ponte Canet, um, but I love the way that the Ponte Canet has created so much conversation um, in the middle of the tasting. And I think, um, you know, there's a place for that in the world of wine um, is to push the boundaries and to see what can be what we do next. Um, so on that, um, 
before I hand over to Regan, and I'm sure he's got some final sort of thoughts on the um, wines and the tasting, um, I did have two things to do, and that was to, perhaps three, um, was to say thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. I know that's been a reasonably long tasting, but there's been a lot um, to tell you about there. Also to let you know that um, we do have some of these wines, and Regan will perhaps give us a little bit more info on that in a second, um, but just to say, if we don't have the one that you um, are looking for, um, this is a reasonably recent release into the market. So we're very happy to, um, and we'll be able to go buy some more. Um, the price might, may not be exactly the same, but we're not too far from the release of them. So it shouldn't have gone too crazy um, just yet. Also to let you know that uh, coming up um, in the next couple of weeks, uh, Regan and I are doing another tasting together, looking at um, fine wine new arrivals. So it's a very eclectic tasting of things from all around the world that have arrived recently, which will be very, very cool. And we also have after that a tasting which um, is friends with attitude or there's lots of different um, uh, interpretations of this. But essentially, um, if you took four of the smartest winemakers out of central Otago or out of New Zealand um, and took Sarah Kate Dean from Maud, um, you've got um, Duncan from Mount Edward, uh, then the Dicey's, um, so from their label Dicey now, and then we head up north and grab Ben Glover from Marlborough. The four of them have taken grapes off the same vineyard in central Otago and have made their own expression of that site. They're going to jump online um, together. So all four of them online is going to be crazy. And they're going to taste what they've made along with their own estate wine. So it'll be a really cool tasting to explore you know, the, the influence of people in making wine, um, which is obviously a really big part of it. So if you're not booked for those two tastings, really strongly suggest that you do. There's also a really cool collection of whiskey tastings and spirit tastings coming up. You'll find all the details up on our website. But yeah, cheers, guys, and thanks for joining us. Cool. Regan. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, that, um, that fine wine tasting that Liz and I are doing, that's on Thursday this week. So if you do want to join that book this weekend, because we're going to be sending those out probably very early next week. Uh, but that's going to be jumping all over the place. We've got... Um, Oh, what are we drink? We're drinking a Grand Cru Chablis, uh, Le Clos, uh, Mont Redon Chateau Neuf de Pup, uh, Blanc. I think there's another. There's another white in there as well, Liz. But there was a third white. I can't yeah. remember what that was. Uh, a couple from South America, um, Chateau Plants, uh, Pomerol, um, 2018. 